All right, we are live. <laughs> All right, hello everybody. Uh, I'm going to quickly introduce myself again and then move it on to my guests and allow them to introduce themselves or my co-host and our guest. My name is Eric Maddox. I'm the host of Latitude Adjustment Podcast. And yeah, I don't think I need to say much else. Uh, Leo, do you want to you introduce yourself and our guest and maybe also what we're, we're discussing today? Sure. Um, just to note that Eric is coming to us live from Germany, and Ra'ed and I are both coming to you from the Washington, D.C. area. I'm Leila Mukheber. I am co-hosting these live sessions with Eric. Um, and uh, my day gig from 9 to 5, I am the Director of Communications for UNRWA USA. In a previous life, well, let me tell you, for those who don't know, UNRWA USA is an organization, an NGO based in D.C. that educates Americans about the plight of Palestine refugees in order to generate support for UNRWA, the agency's work, providing humanitarian and development support in Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, the West Bank, Gaza, um, some of the places that we'll be speaking about today. But in my former life, I worked for the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee. And for that short bit of time, that's actually when I met Eric. It was right as I left ADC. And I think it was my exact first day joining under USA, which is like seven years ago. And I had the pleasure of meeting Ra'id during that time of my life. And he was my boss. <laughs> Yeah. But now Ra'ed has found himself, we both found ourselves in different places. Um, today he's doing um, work with the American Muslims for Palestine as their director of advocacy. He's a uh, media personality. He was one of the first bloggers from the Arab world. He is a post-war reconstruction architect. I mean, Ra'ed is everything. And I want him to talk more about who he is. Um, and through this conversation, we are going to ask him some questions about the situation in Iraq. Um, which many people forget about because it's not in the headlines anymore. And the situation in Palestine, especially amidst what's happening right now um, with the looming threat of annexation. So Ra'ed, please kind of give everyone more of a taste and flavor of who you are, and then we'll jump right in. Well, thank you, Leila. Thanks, uh, Eric, for uh, having me on, on your uh, podcast. Uh, I actually remember meeting uh, Eric back in the day with you, Leila. I think it was okay. seven years ago. It was 2013. Exactly today, I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Happy fun anniversary, y'all! Seven <laughs> years. <laughs> so it's uh, yeah, it's uh, it's good to reconnect. I guess yeah. uh, much has changed in the last seven years. I also I don't remember being your boss at ADC. I thought you were my boss. Depends <laughs> 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 on who you ask. <laughs> you are my friend, most importantly, and I, I have so much respect for you. It doesn't matter what the title is, but you know, we did work together, and that's how we met. Thank you. So yeah, I mean, we Leila and I are very close friends. We coordinate on social events, you know, activist events. Um, uh, my wife and I run in the Onrwa uh, 5K every year to raise funds, uh, and we get some sort of a trophy either for. Uh, raising a lot of money or bringing too many people on our team or something. Or having the cutest kids. <laughs> so we appreciate, uh, everyone appreciates Leila's leadership in the DC area when it comes to issues that has to do with Palestine and Palestine refugees. Um, and as Leila mentioned, I am myself uh, half Palestinian. My father is from Palestine and I'm half Iraqi. I guess that's why we're splitting the interview today between Iraq and Palestine 50-50. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm a U.S. citizen. I've been living in D.C. Uh, since 2005. And before that, I lived in California. Um, but I, I mean, today, I guess that we, we will be chatting about some issues that have to do with, with um, Iraq uh, in D.C. and Palestine in D.C. Uh, because that's where I live. Mm. Yeah, so I mean, we can start with what's happening in DC today as well. Should we address this straight out of the gate? Yeah, I mean, a lot is happening in DC actually. Uh, there are protests in the streets of DC as we speak. Uh, I know there is a, a protest uh, outside the Israeli embassy uh, happening right now uh, where uh, US, Americans, Palestinians, Muslims, Arabs, allies are uh, protesting outside the Israeli embassy and saying no to the impending annexation uh, plans. Uh, but also we've seen amazing, unprecedented protests inside the hallways of Congress in the last uh, week or so. Um, there were two major letters that were sent by Congress to uh, different uh, parts of the administration or to the Israeli government 
Uh, and these letters uh, expressed uh, strong opposition to uh, annexation. Uh, so one letter was sent by 191 members of uh, Congress, they're all Democrats. Uh, it, opposed, it opposes annexation. Um, it, it, and uh, it's actually unprecedented to have this many people from Congress uh, sign on a letter that doesn't say, we heart Israel. Like, uh, you know, back in the day when I moved to, to DC in 2005, the biggest we could get uh, of uh, any um, dissent when it comes to, uh, you know, the usual blind support to Israel was having maybe four members of Congress um, vote present on pro-Israeli legislation and statements. So they don't vote no, they just don't vote. And when they don't do that, they get hammered by the pro-Israel lobby. Uh, so now it's amazing that we are in a moment where 191 members of Congress um, uh, are, are willing to stick their heads out uh, uh, and, and like put, the, put themselves literally in, in a place that would have been political suicide a decade ago. And now it's political suicide not to do this because working on Palestine has become a core issue uh, to be a progressive. And working with Palestine has become um, a partisan issue uh, in, 2000, in, in 2020 uh, after it was uh, not a partisan issue in the past. So things have really shifted a lot. The second letter that I mentioned was signed by a smaller group, uh, 13 members of Congress. And that one also opposes annexation, but it has an unprecedented threat to condition U.S. military aid to Israel to make sure that it will not go to uh, subsidize annexation. Uh, and in this letter of 13 also uh, talks about apartheid and how annexation is paving the way to apartheid. These are unprecedented words. You know, apartheid is a, a crime against humanity. Uh, annexation as um, Israel is uh, announcing it this week and how it was implementing it the last few decades uh, is actually a war crime uh, under international law. So we're talking about very serious language coming from Congress. Of course, at the same time, uh, Republicans have also sent uh, a letter. Uh, there was a letter, I think, by 164 uh, Republicans to uh, uh, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, supporting annexation. So you can see that the, in a way, uh, Palestine is becoming an issue that cannot be glo glossed over. You have to say something. You know, there is, uh, it's, a, it's a partisan issue. 164 members of Congress say yes to annexation. 191 say no to annexation. People are threatening to cut um, aid, etc. So like when you look at the letters, it's obviously an issue that is uh, will push more people to um, make a declaration of where they stand on it. So one more thing I want to say about that before uh, we talk about out things outside of DC is that last night there was also a bombshell in the Senate uh, because um, 13 senators, all Democrats, introduced uh, some language uh, to be added uh, uh, to a, like a must-pass legislation in DC. And that language is unprecedented. It actually uh, requires that the U.S. Um, uh, not spend any money to subsidize annexation. Uh, this has never happened before. This, this is literally earth shattering in D.C. Thirteen members of the Senate, uh, led by Senator Van Hollen. You know, we're talking about like big names like Senator Warren, um, Senator Leahy, uh, Bernie Sanders. All of these big names joined these thirteen initial names to introduce an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act. And it's a one paragraph amendment. It's really amazing that we're having mainstream um, leaders saying that US dollars should not be used to subsidize the annexation. This is like for DC, that is literally a political earthquake. So a really quick follow up before we move on uh, to Iraq, and that is, what is the partisan representation and on both sides in this? You mentioned that there's a letter that has been written in support of Netanyahu. Yeah. Um, what, what's the representation on both sides? Is it strictly along partisan lines, or is there some Republicans supporting? One hundred percent. One hundred percent. 
uh, Palestine is a partisan issue now. Uh, and uh, the 191 members of Congress who said no to annexation are all Democrats. 164 said yes to annexation are all Republicans, 100%. Wow. So there's wow. a, a party divide there. Um, obviously, Trump is a Republican and he's leading this, um, uh, you know, the U.S. support to annexation. Um, so it's it's a very, very partisan issue. It has never been like this before. I think one of the um, biggest losses for APEC and the Israel lobby in D.C., in the last decade, that um, the issue of Israel-Palestine has become partisan. Because before that, they took pride uh, at saying that we have bipartisan support of Israel. And that usually meant blind, unconditional support that would, lo- would not hold Israel accountable and will not stop Israeli crimes. Uh, and now we have an extremely partisan situation where Israel um, and Netanyahu are becoming... Uh, affiliated with Trump uh, and the Trump Netanyahu alliance is an extremely partisan alliance um, and it's changing politics in DC. This, Israel is not just a uh, you know non non issue in the background that we we can't even pick up to discuss. No, it is the issue of the day, uh, and many um, activists inside and outside of Congress are saying that you can't. In 2020, you can't be working on social justice uh, and uh, police brutality and um, anti-racism activism in the U.S. where we all um, have been chanting Black Lives Matter and defund the police without thinking about what's going on in Palestine, without thinking about what's going on in Iraq, without thinking about how our foreign policy impacts the world the same way that our racist domestic policy impacts us yeah. here. So I think Palestine is coming to the agenda also because of that. Like there are all of these, uh, in like the context is perfect for us to talk about social justice and racism, not only in the US, but internationally. Yeah, and I think we, we all, anybody who's been working close to this issue, especially in the US side knows that there's been a longstanding, like, expression for this caveat that seems to ignore Palestine while being progressive on every other issue, like pep people, so to speak, right? Progressive yeah. except for Palestine. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, so we'll take, I'm going to take kind of a, a rough segue into uh, our next topic, and we will come back to Palestine um, in a few moments. But first, I want to go back to uh, talk about Iraq. And when I say go back, I mean that you were uh, my guest a few months ago, um, and uh, a lot has happened in Iraq since. And a lot of things have happened that I'm probably unaware of, which is part of what we want to talk to you about. But the last time we spoke, this is before the Soleimani assassination, um, and it was in the middle of um, some large-scale protests. So I'm just going to ask it to you really generally. What's been happening in Iraq since we last talked? I believe it was in late November. Um, aside and uh, since the since the the assassination at the beginning of the year, um, the, yeah, the media seems to have moved on. But uh, how can we refocus on that? What have we missed? Um, Iraq, like the U.S. and every other country, Germany, uh, has been dealing with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And Iraq is a war-torn country that has been destroyed by the U.S. uh, intervention since 1991. Uh, Lacks the most basic tools uh, for public safety and um, for keeping its citizens informed or um, healthy during a a time of an international uh, pandemic. So unfortunately, like the pandemic has been hitting Iraq very bad. Um, um, There is no like uh, government capable of uh, producing information that is seen as uh, legitimate. so pe- people are like kind of confused about what's going on. They listen to their um, religious leaders, to their political leaders. It's different messages that are very confusing. Uh, I saw a couple a couple months ago there was this awful um, announcement by 
religious leaders in Iraq asking people to go participate in religious ceremonies uh, where thousands of people rushed into um, like closed areas, shared the same food and it was awful. Like it was unbelievably awful. It, it shows that like there are structural problems in the country that are obviously consequences of a foreign military in, in, invasion that completely dismantled the state, destroyed the country, destroyed um, governance hierarchy in the country, destroyed uh, education, destroyed healthcare. So it's it's awful. Like it's really hitting Iraq very much, and the pandemic definitely affected the the uprising uh, that was happening last time we chatted. So uh, last year, Iraqis took to the streets. There was a very strong movement, uh, an uprising that was viewed mostly as an uprising against uh, foreign interventions uh, and the ruling parties. So many people viewed viewed it as an uprising against the U.S. and Iran. These are the two main powers messing with Iraq. Um, and people were demonstrating against Iran and against the U.S. at the same time. Uh, and the Iraqi government, um, supported by U.S. aid and weapons, supported by Iranian militias, crushed the demonstrators, killed almost 600 uh, within a few weeks. Uh, awful mass murders in the streets uh, that uh, barely got any coverage in the U.S. Um, and but there was like a, a spot outside in Tahrir Square in, in Baghdad that was occupied by uh, protesters for a long time. It kind of died away because of the uh, because of the pandemic, uh, pandemic and violence against against the protesters. So everything is kind of on hold. I haven't really seen that much happening uh, on that level. We also mentioned the assassination of Soleimani, that was uh, used by the. Iraqi government uh, and m many parties in the Iraqi government to um, try to justify, uh, you know, like um, uh, some of the Iraqi government's policies uh, being pro-Iran or uh, trying to be anti uh, the U.S. Some some parties in the Iraqi government are closer to Iran than the U.S. Some parties are closer closer to the U.S. than Iran. So. It was used like to uh, for for domestic consumption to try to change some of the dynamics inside the country, um, and it was also used to justify crushing some parts of the uh, of the protests that were happening in the country. So, in short, I would say not much has been going on. Um, I would say the pandemic is the is the number one reason why people are not are not in the streets. Like you can't have a million people in Tahrir Square at the time of uh, a pandemic, uh, but also the excessive uh, violence, uh, state violence that is supported by the US and Iran also contributed to that. I would imagine that the, I mean, the, the their political and economic fortunes certainly haven't, haven't improved in the intervening months and as a result as of, the, of the pandemic, I would imagine people are in pretty desperate situation at the moment. I mean, the situation in Iraq is awful, uh, and it keeps deteriorating uh, because the the foundations for the current um, government and state uh, are rotten. The foundations, uh, th this state and government that were built after the U.S. invasion, uh, are are not built on strong foundations. And th there is no hope that without fundamental change to the concept of governance, that Iraq will become a prosperous country. This is a, a corrupt uh, regime that is reliant on foreign interventions to survive. It has built a wall between um, the so-called green zone and the so-called red zone. Red zone is wh where people live, and green zone is where politicians live. It's unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, it's like literally a dystopian, uh, you know, novel <laughs> about how a corrupt government can operate. Um, politicians live and uh, operate separately in this little town of them. Uh, they get paid uh, a huge portion of the country's budget. Each politician gets paid tens of thousands of dollars a month. 
um, even like lower level, tens of thousands of dollars a month. Um, like, just think about like an Iraqi member of parliament gets paid more than a U.S. member of Congress gets paid more than the U.S. president. Uh, and uh, they're not really required to go to sessions that much. Um, there were interesting statistics about how a, a big chunk uh, of the Iraqi parliament uh, members never attended a session in the last uh, parliament. They live in London and Tehran and D.C., wherever they live. It's unbelievable. Like The corruption is unbelievable. According to Transparency International, uh, which uh, it's an international organization that... Mm -hmm. uh, produces an annual uh, index of corruption. Iraq has been among the top five most corrupt countries in the world for the last decade or so. So it's a corrupt government. It's uh, financially corrupt, uh, ethically corrupt, uh, you know, <laughs> politically corrupt. Um, it, it is unable to sustain itself without having the US and Iran um, support it. It's unable to um, provide its people with the most basic services. It's unable. It's it's not equipped to do that. It's a client regime that is not designed to create a prosperous country. So the answer to the question, has Iraq become better, is no. It has not become better. Is Iraq going to become better in the next six months? It's not. Unless there is a fundamental change in governance that changes the idea of governing the country from what it's based now on sectarian and ethnic lines on parties that are supported by foreign invaders and foreign powers to a government that actually represents Iraq as a nation and looks for the interests of Iraq and Iraqis regardless of their backgrounds. So, so I mean, that, that's the paradigm that we're stuck with. Yeah, I mean, I I can't resist. I'm sorry. I had to ask this kind of one more follow up. But it's more of an observation, I think, than anything that we could even verify. But one of the things that you that you noted uh, in our last interview was the non sectarian, in fact, anti sectarian nature of the protests. That these are people who like um, have grown up since. In many cases, it was it was characterized by a lot of young people on the streets, and they've grown up since the U.S. invasion. And I wonder again, I guess time will tell whether or not the fact that the pandemic doesn't discriminate along sectarian lines either. And it seems like the corruption is also crossing sectarian lines, hence the non-sectarian nature of the protests. I wonder if that might also, you know, just reinforce the sense of common cause and solidarity. People are going to be equally suffering or at least uh, equally subject to the indiscriminate nature of a virus um, at the same time that they're all kind of in the same uh, circumstances as a result of the corruption. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you might be right. I mean, it's too early to tell uh, if the global pandemic will have uh, like a unification, uh, you know, side effect where people feel like, you know, like in the movies when aliens attack Earth and everyone bonds together and um, <laughs> work yeah. together. I mean, th that might be uh, like an, an aftertaste. Uh, that's not something that's happening now because now everyone yeah. is like the, the pandemic has um, added an additional restraint on social yeah. organizing, social movements. And, you know, unlike here in the US or in Germany where uh, people are more connected on online. Um, Iraq is one of the uh, worst countries in the world when it comes to internet penetration and the, the use of internet. It's not as popular uh, as, as um, other neighboring countries or, or other countries uh, in the region. Um, so it's not as easy to organize uh, without meeting people in person. I know Iraqis uh, have been like for the last 10 or 15 years they have been organizing over cell phones because everyone has a cell phone or two or three depending on where you live because um cell phone networks are not very strong so usually people have cell phones um and they organize over over cell phones and cell phones are not really online so they organize over text messages uh, between them um, and it's very, very, it's an, it's an amazing cultural phenomenon that I remember a couple of years ago, there was this like scandalous video uh, of um, like a leading religious figure uh, that spread around the country. People were sharing the video that ended up discrediting 
this religious figure and pushing him outside the like uh, the like the, the public um, uh, debate completely. Um, everyone in Iraq watched the video. I couldn't find it online. It was amazing. It's like this set parallel bubble of text messaging where people send each other, but uh, like there is no. Um, cross contamination, you know, <laughs> between the text messaging bubble and the internet, and it's just contained there, you know. Like I was asking people, like, to text it to me or or send it to me on WhatsApp or something, because it's completely separate. So anyway, I'm saying, like, the point that I'm making is that the pandemic affects social organizing a lot, because like when we saw, uh, like, when people were were organizing in Tahrir Square or other parts or, uh, in, in Iraq. They mostly did that in, in person, like people showed up to Friday prayers and um, talked to each other or Muqtada uh, al-Sadr said something, you know, whatever, like, it's, like, it's usually like different kinds of communication uh, than now. So we have we have to wait and see what, what's going to happen. I think, as you indicated, Eric, like, I, I did describe the movement as an anti-sectarian movement. So it's not just um, a movement that is oblivion of sectarianism it's a movement that actually um, grew up under a sectarian regime uh, and they're mostly young kids who either were not born or don't remember the iraqi government under saddam hussein so the one and only talking point of this iraqi government which is we are not saddam and saddam was bad doesn't work for them because they're like who is saddam like they don't care about who saddam is they care about the fact that they, they were born like 2000, and they the their first memory is a, a U.S. airplane bombing their neighborhood in 2003, and their country has been um, completely destroyed since. So their entire life is uh, uh, like civil conflict and corrupt government, uh, and they don't care about what happened before that. Not only that, they hear from their parents nostalgic analysis about what happened from before, where Sunnis and Shia lived in the same neighborhoods. We never talked about Sunnis and Shia before. There are many people who are half Sunnis and half Shia, like me, I am half, half Sunni and half Shia. Um, the, before that, you know, the government was an awful dictatorship, but it wasn't a sectarian dictatorship, it was a political dictatorship. So when they hear these things, they're like, why are we doing this to ourselves now? So there is definitely like a very strong movement um, that has roots, like historic roots, uh, that is opposing sectarianism. And I think I mentioned this on your on, on, on the interview last time, and um, it's fascinating to see how the descendants of those Iraqis who fought with Iran against Iraq during the Iraq-Iran war, and the descendants of those Iraqis who fought um, with the Iraqi army against the Iranian army, around that time, are fighting in the streets of Baghdad and, and Basra and Najaf now. It's unbelievable. Um, and I mean, I, I thought, I think that war was uh, unjustified and um, completely uncalled for, ended up killing a million Iraqis and Iranians. But there, were, there was a political line set there, ideological line set there. And that ideological line included Sunnis and Shia and Kurds from uh, Iraq, you know, Sunnis, Shia, Kurds from Iraq, others from, from Iran, and some Iraqis crossed the border and fought on Iran's side. Those Iraqis, like the Supreme Council people or uh, Badr brigades, or they, these ones are exactly the same ones who are, that the, either them or their, the continuation of their parties are fighting against those who fought on the, on the Iraqi side. And it, it's un unbelievable to, to think about how deep the divide this is not the you know conflict du jour you know this is not something that people woke up this morning and thought about this is a very structural historic you know division of uh, divide of people who believe that iraq should be a civil um uh, sh should be a, a civic country uh, run by a secular um government uh, that uh, respects the, the separation between state uh, and mosque, um, that uh, provides services to its people, that Iraqis should be 
Iraqi first. That, that's one group. The other group is people who believe that they are Shia first or Kurdish first or Sunni first. They don't believe in Iraq. They want to destroy Iraq and cut it into smaller pieces. They think that they belong to Iran because they're Shia or they belong to uh, another country. And th that divide is really very, very deep and ideological that it's, um, you, you, there is no way to resolve it. Um, like uh, the way that the U.S. did, which is invade the country, bring their allies who are sectarian and, and anti-Iraqi to run Iraq. You know, uh, like the the example that I have given uh, to U.S. audiences throughout the years is: imagine if a foreign country um, invaded the U.S. in 1860 and placed Robert E. Lee to be the president of USA uh, rather than CSA. Like, that is the mentality of people who run Iraq now. They are the separatist, separatists who don't think that Baghdad should exist, uh, who are in charge of Baghdad. Um, so, so, like, the, like when, you, when you look at it, like, the, the, the divisions have been there. The U.S. role in upping some side against another uh, is so unsustainable. And uh, we're going to get to a point where things are going to fundamentally change. Thank you. And I realize now that we put a lot on your plate for like Palestine and Iraq for, for one hour is a lot. So um, just in the interest of time, we're probably going to have to push forward here a bit. But thank you for the very robust answers. Leila, I'll, I'll zip it now. No, Return. sure. I was just going to thank Raed for always being um, such a source of information. I mean, you think you know a lot about these issues and then you hear Raed speak about them and you're like, mind blown. <laughs> and you have such a um, just a beautiful way of articulating yourself. It's really easy for someone to understand, even if they have no understanding of the context. Um, I know we put in the comments that you could be listening to the interview um, between Eric and Raed about the protests, episode 53 of the podcast. But I'm also curious, Raed, like, how do you stay informed on what's happening? And are you following Arabic media? Are you just texting with the people you know in Iraq? I mean, I know most of your family is scattered around the world. Um, mm -hmm. What kind of resources maybe do you recommend for our viewers and for Eric and I, just so that we can be more aware um, of obviously the very difficult situation that the Iraqi people face? Yeah, I mean, thank you for the compliments and apologies for the long-winded uh, answer. That's why we brought you here. <laughs> That's why you're here, man. That's why so, you're here. I mean, I stay informed. Yeah, mostly in Arabic. I think uh, th there is a, like a language divide when it comes to um, information coming about Iraq to the U.S. Um, so I usually read Iraqi newspapers. There are five or six main ones that I, I check uh, almost daily. Um, there's Sabah, Zaman, uh, Sabah and Jadid. There are a few smaller ones that, that I check. Uh, social media contacts of people who I know in Basra, in, in, in Najaf, in Baghdad. Um, some hashtags that I have saved on my social media to put it there. It's mostly in Arabic, though. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't really make it to, to English. I would say, like, checking Al Jazeera is always a, a good source of information of what's going on in, in Iraq. There is also a divide in between Al Jazeera Arabic and the Jazeera English. Al Jazeera Arabic goes way in, more in depth in what's going on in Iraq. Mm. Um, but so yeah, I mean, I would say like so, regional uh, uh, sources of information. For Al Jazeera is a good source of what's going on there. Um, and um, in, inside Iraq, um, I'm not sure there's any reliable English. Uh, sources uh, but um, um, sometimes there are like uh, if you look up um, social media hashtags that are going on uh, like viral at, at the moment uh, some people in Iraq or people like me who like translate things from Iraq and post it on social media we, we use the, the same uh, hashtags uh, like I remember last time uh, we used like uh, uh, Tahrir Square uh, hashtag uh, there was uh, uh, there were a couple of other ones as well. So. Uh, Rod, one of our listeners is asking if you write a blog because I was also just gonna. She read my mind because I was just gonna suggest you could also follow Rod on Twitter and wherever he's posting stuff. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I actually, I, I used to have a blog back in the day when blogs were thing, uh, like back in two thousand and two, two thousand and three, two thousand and four. Um, 
I had a blog from from Baghdad, uh, but uh, I mean I haven't been blogging for, for a long time. But I am active on, um, I mean not as active as Leila, but active on social media, <laughs> as in I post once every week or so. Uh, but um, I am on Twitter and and Facebook. If you uh, look up my name. What's your what, yeah? What's your handle on Twitter? It's Raed Jarad. R A E J A R R A R. Okay. And then, yeah, I mean, we started at the first part of the show talking about some of the the action that's being taken at the political level, the congressional level in the U.S. with regards to Palestine. But what can Americans, and also we've got people that listen to the show that are international as well. So maybe we can frame this in two parts. What can Americans be doing to to offer some sort of support or assistance to the Iraqi people. And and also, if you can expand that globally too, what can people mm -hmm. who just care about Iraq and the fortunes of the Iraqi people, what can they be doing? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, that's like the, like the, the most recurrent, frequently asked question, like what can we do about it, which I love. And I think that's a very good question to ask because um, as U.S. Americans, when it comes to Iraq or to Palestine, um, we are not audiences. We're not just watching uh, conflicts between, you know, foreign people. Uh, we're contributing to these conflicts with our money, with uh, with our politics. Um, so, I mean, the number one thing to do, whether it's Iraq or Palestine, uh, the number one thing to do for uh anyone in the US who is a tax taxpayer or a citizen or a resident, number one thing to do is to get out of the way, uh, to take the US out of Iraq, take the US out of Israel-Palestine, because the US is a part of the problem in both. It's not a part of the solution. The US military and political intervention in Iraq is a part of the problem. And it has been uh, subsidizing the corrupt uh, criminal government in Baghdad for uh, 15, 16, 17 years old, 17 years now. And uh, it's, it's wasted trillions of tax dollars money, trillions, on uh, a war that has destroyed Iraq, killed over a million Iraqis, uh, and displaced more than six or seven million Iraqis to other countries so far. So the number one thing we can do is to ask our government to get the heck out of Iraq. That's the number one gift that we can give to Iraqis is to get out of their country. And and, and then we can talk about uh, ways for compensation, reconciliation, building bridges with Iraqis to fix what our uh, government has done in their country. Um, that's a long conversation, but I don't think that conversation can and should happen while we are still there in Iraq interfering in the country. I am a very harsh critic to the narrative of if we were to leave Iraq, the sky will fall and the Iraqis will kill each other, uh, Iran will take over Iraq, etc. Because uh, that, that kind of denies the agency of Iraqis to deal with their country by themselves. And like Iraqis don't need the U.S. to, to babysit them, um, to make, to, to like protect them from an evil uh, other country who's coming to mess with their internal issues. The U.S. is that evil country that is messing with their issues. Like we're not the protector in, in that scenario. And even for people who are as critical of Iran as they are of the U.S., which is me, and I would say the majority of protesters in Iraq over the last year, getting the U.S. out is actually a good step to getting Iran out. Because Iran is also using the U.S. intervention as a justification to be there. So Iran says, we, we, we can't leave because the U.S. is going to take over, and the U.S. says we can't leave because Iran is going to take over. I mean, they're both taking over. Iraq does not want either of them. And um, I think we in the U.S. should also tell our government that we do not want um, to continue to interfere in Iraq. The U.S. intervention started in 1991, and it has never ended since. Um, and the 
yeah, like I would say there are two main arguments that have maintained uh, the U.S. intervention uh, in Iraq uh, since 1991. One big argument is that we have to be there for our interest and to take the oil. It's a very small portion, but this is like the hawkish, you know, uh, U.S. imperialists who are actually willing to say these things. I would say that's the minority justification for being there. The majority justification is more of a humanitarian intervention. We have to be there for their own good. So if we're in Iraq, you know, we're taking care of them, bringing them democracy, protecting them from each other, making sure that the Sunnis are not going to eat the Shias, kill them, whatever, um, that Iran is going to, Saudi Arabia is not going to do this. And that narrative is so rooted in it's like white supremacist um, complex that this country has. It's like the like wh white man's burden of saving the natives. It's so extremely racist. It's it is that it explains the like the the it is where the U.S. foreign policy is grounded in um, racism, intervention, imperialism. I'll all come back to this main idea that Iraqis are not as capable of humans to take care of their country by themselves. You have to be there to teach them how to um, um, create their cur curricula, because otherwise it's going to be violent and hateful. We have to build their buildings, because otherwise they're going to collapse. We're going to build their government, otherwise it's not going to be democratic. And, and that kind of racism, we have to oppose it the same way that we oppose racism and white supremacy here in, inside the US. And the same goes to Palestine. And I think now, this week, it's an exceptional week to talk about Palestine because the U.S. has been subsidizing Israeli crimes for decades now. As many of your viewers know, uh, the United States sends um, now $3.8 billion a year of our tax dollars to Israel. Uh, and this is completely free money, unconditional. There are no checks and balances. You know, other countries receive the same kind of money with checks and balances. Israel receives it completely with no checks and balances. Free money falls in their lap. So Israel uh, receives the majority of foreign military financing of the entire world, more than 50, 52 or 53 percent of the entirety of the United States foreign military financing goes to Israel. One country. And although we are required by law to track where that money goes, who receives it, if there are human rights violations, we shouldn't be giving those units, etc. Israel is completely exempt, not by law, just by practice, de facto exemption. No one, no one knows where the money goes. There is no tracking mechanism. We dump the whole money in, in the first 30 days of the fiscal year, unlike any other country in the world. Um, Did I lose you guys? Oh, you're still there. No, I think Leila's just changed yeah. the. I was <laughs> highlighting what you were saying. Sorry if you thought we had. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I was saying like that. That money is is used to subsidize Israel's occupation, uh, Israel's murders uh, almost on a daily basis, Israel's uh, sanction, uh, Israel's embargo of, of Gaza. Uh, the treatment of Palestinians, it's all subsidized by billions of U.S. dollars that go there. So now what we saw in the last week is that many U.S. Americans have been saying there is a new impending um, war crime that's going to happen. That is called annexation. Now, there is a de facto annexation that has been going on for decades where Israel is stealing Palestinian land piece by piece every day, building a new settlement here, a new settlement there. That's what we call it, the de facto annexation, adding, you know, these pieces of land from the West Bank to, to Israel um, without actually declaring it. Now, this week, the Israeli government was uh, supposed to announce an official annexation, uh, brokered and blessed by the Trump administration. And that annexation would actually add this Palestinian land to Israel. This adding Palestinian land to Israel might sound like something that happened in the past. You know, we talk about the U.S. annexing Hawaii. I think it's a disgusting racist crime. When it happened at the time, it was not against international law because there was no international law set in that arena. In 2020, we actually have international law set in that regards. 
there are different categories of international law, but this particular one uh, is um, international humanitarian law, including the four Geneva Conventions. The, the four Geneva Conventions have been, are so old, almost everyone has signed them, that whether or not you've signed them, they count as law at this stage, because it's like common law in the US or in Britain. You know, it's like, meh, everyone knows what the Geneva Conventions are. So, so they're, they're considered by all the top um, legal entities, international legal entities in the world as existing law. One important part about the Geneva Conventions is that transferring one's uh, population into an occupied territory is uh, considered a war crime. And annexing that, war, uh, that, that uh, occupied territory into your land is considered a war crime. These are war crimes. There, there are no two legal scholars out there who would say, no, it's, it's not really a war crime. It's kind of okay to annex occupied territory. No, there isn't. There's no debate about it. This is a clean cut conversation. Uh, and more importantly, uh, according to the same Geneva Convention, um, uh, the, the conventions and other international law bodies, um, the international um, uh, like a few other international uh, agreements, you know, there is no international policeman uh, or police station that enforces these uh, regulations. Every nation state enforces that by itself, you know. So any nation state that supports or condones or um, uh, assess, assists a, a war crime is also a violation of international law. So the fact that the U.S., is uh, not stopping the Israeli annexation, which is a clear uh, war crime. The U.S. support by itself is also a violation of international law because the yeah, U.S. has a state responsibility to stop war crimes when they're happening. So what we're, happen what we're happening here is, and that's the answer to your question, what can we do? What we should do is demand that our tax dollars are not used to subsidize Israeli crimes. We should demand that our tax dollars are not being used to subsidize the Iraqi government's crimes in Iraq, any other government. I think that is the number one thing to do, you know. Like many people imagine that if I w w wanted to help uh, Palestinians or Iraqis, I should go there and like stand with them and, uh, like on the front lines. That's good. You can do that. If you can't do that, the, the easiest thing to do and the most important thing to do is to demand that our dollars, your tax dollars, the money that we're paying to our government every year, that that money does not end up going to Israel to subsidize its crimes, or to the Iraqi government, or to other governments around the world to subsidize their crimes that are uh, being committed on a daily basis. A quick follow-up question I have to this is that it's been my understanding that, for, because I think the first settlements started shortly after the Sixth Day or 67. I mean, this has been going for over half a century. That's right. So, and that's right. Like the two, the two words that we use now are the de facto annexation and the de jure annexation. Like the, yeah. the actually an announcement of yeah. uh, you know fifty or sixty years of war crimes of uh, transferring Israeli populations into occupied territory and building settlements quietly and, and, and slowly to this like grand announcement like. You know, voila! We have uh, we're we're committing this war crime, and now we're adding everything to to there. So I agree with you. It's not like Israel is announcing that they are going to start breaching uh, international law. It's actually an announcement of uh, what they've been doing for decades. A point of confusion they've had about why they're doing this so openly. Um, I mean, they've been committing war crimes openly for decades, in a sense. But I've the way I've understood it is that formally announcing annexation would trigger some of the international instruments that you're describing. Because it is illegal under international law, Israel is a signatory to the Fourth Geneva Convention, uh, to take to annex territory taken under force of arms, to do population transfer, all of which the, have taken place. But to but to but Israel's gotten away with some of this stuff in a sense, first of all, because it's protected by the US's uh, UN veto. But but um, also because it's it's been doing some of these things in kind of this legal gray area where it's not formally announced its borders. I think it's one of the only countries that hasn't actually formally declared what its borders are so that it can kind of play both sides. Like we can have settlements, but uh, but it's not ours. But everybody in those settlements has Israeli citizenship. 
<laughs> right? That's so right. to formally announce it, I'd always thought that this like that's the tripwire that they that they don't want to cross because then it would be a formal recognition of a violation of international law. Is it that they're doing it because they recognize it in the the Trump administration that they were going to have more legal cover for this? I mean, they've had legal cover this whole time anyway. I don't want to put this just on Trump. Yeah, um, it's not legal. It's political cover. Yes, I agree. I mean, that is what's going on. So you have like a bunch of loonies in the Trump Trump administration, like uh, Ambassador Friedman, uh, who is uh, like an extremist, uh, more extreme than Israeli settlers, literally, uh, who yeah. is negotiating and pressuring. And Kushner. And Kushner. And Kushner. Yeah. These, these people are, are like way outside the political spectrum in the U.S. and, and, and in Israel Palestine. Uh, they are uh, so extreme that they're actually uh, outside the scope of extreme in, in Israel. They're, they've been pushing for these uh, ideological commitments that they have. Friedman takes, takes it upon himself, the U.S. ambassador to Israel, takes it upon himself to try to broker a, a, an agreement among Israeli parties to make sure that annexation would happen. Like imagine the level of intervention. Um, I think uh, from like what's going on now is that the Trump administration is going completely crazy when it comes to its ideological uh, pandering to the right in the U.S. You have right-wing uh, extremists in the U.S. Uh, who have some ideological commitments to um, you know religious uh, ideological uh, dogmatic beliefs about what's going to happen. Uh, in Israel, Palestine, uh, and and they're trying to push that through. I don't think they have a legal cover. They have a political cover because this administration is giving them a blank check. The world is not. The EU is freaking out. The UN is freaking out. Uh, even um, Israel's allies in the region are freaking out. Like everyone is, is asking the same question that you're asking. Why? would you announce your war crime publicly? Like someone who, you have like a, a thug in the neighborhood who has been, you know, stealing people's land and, and front yards very, very slowly all over the, the years and saying, oh, no, that my fence is just moving slowly here and there. Why would that thug make an announcement that they are actually taking over the neighborhood's front yards? That, that's a very good question. I think it's a, it's it is a, a very uh, arrogant move by Netanyahu uh, that they're drunk with power and they have been so used to no accountability that they can they think they can get away with it. But I think it's this is going to be a watershed moment where the entire world will unite against Israel's arrogance and uh, and, and and this latest Israeli war crime. I mean, the world can see what's going on. And, you know, Netanyahu and Trump are not sympathetic figures where the world would, like, uh, give them um, a break and the chance to, to do whatever they want to do. So uh, I agree with you. It's, it seems like a miscalculation. They have missed their own imposed deadline. Let's wait and see what's going to happen next. Can I chime in just for a sec? Um, this has been such an interesting conversation so far. I think the people who are watching are learning so much about what's happening because, you know, we're seeing, we're talking about Iraq, the pandemic. We're talking about Palestine. We're talking about annexation. We're talking about Black Lives Matter, protests happening all around the world. It sometimes feels so hard um, to keep up with all the things happening on the planet. And, and making sure you are informed. So I really appreciate these sessions for myself to better understand you know, my own thoughts around these things and um, to deepen that and really know my place. So Rod, again, I wanna compliment you and, and Eric for kind of uh, digging even deeper into this. You know, My work is focused on the humanitarian side of Palestine. So I'm not really involved in the political side, but obviously the political side is what causes these issues. Um, I am going to post in the comments a recent talk that happened um, with the uh, the field director, the Gaza field director from UNRWA and talking about the implications of this annexation on refugees. Um, there are areas, you know, they have these settlements that they're going to be annexing in, but then there's areas where there's UNRWA schools, UNRWA health clinics and services that would be cut off from people who really have nowhere else to turn for these sort of things. Um, 
Can you talk a little more, Raj, from what you know about the areas that um, will be impacted and just what you know so that our viewers watching can understand kind of what this means in practice? Maybe yeah. in the context of like A, B, and C areas, I don't yeah. know how many people are aware, like how Oslo sure. already kind of broke down the, the West Bank into different political designated territories. We actually don't know exactly. Uh, the announcement has not been made. Uh, what we know is the fact that Oslo is dead. Uh, so Oslo created a peace agreement that uh, like a, a, a road, roadmap for Palestinians and Israelis to come to a, like a two-state uh, solution. And we know that Oslo is dead. Like even the last supporters of Oslo from the Palestinian Authority side uh, just withdrew from the agreement a few weeks ago. They're like, okay, that's not working. Forget about it. Um, so they also created this A, B, C uh, categorization of different lands. Some lands are A that are like, you know, the downtown Ramallah or Jenin is like area A that's controlled 100% by Palestinians. C are areas that are not controlled by Palestinians uh, but will have control in the future. And B are the ones in the gray area that are shared control. So area C is um, initially what we thought was that Israel will annex uh, all of area C's it's kind of more complicated than that, because on the one hand, Israel is uh, now saying they might only annex uh, settlements that were built uh, since, you know, 48, for since 67 in East Jerusalem, other places. Um, some of them are actually not in Area C, some of them are, uh, so it's, it's kind of uh, like it's, th this agreement creates a new categorization. It's a new moment that actually destroys, takes away uh, the, the, um, the Oslo agreements and, and creates this new system. Like there is a new map for Gaza, completely new map. It looks really weird. It doesn't look like anything before. It doesn't look like 1948 border or the 1967 border or the Oslo agreement, nothing. It's this new map for Gaza where uh, like a bunch of, of like, uh, it's like a chunk of land from the middle of the desert was added to Gaza. No one has seen that before. Different parts uh, are um, in, in the West Bank. So it's it's confusing. It's it's not really, um, doesn't follow the, the ABC categorization in full. Uh, I would say most of a Area C, if not all, is included in the new things. But it also includes some parts of Area B. In some areas, it seems like it also includes goes inside area A's, it's so co so um, near, uh, like, uh, areas controlled by the Palestinian Authority, which actually, like, like the bigger question that all of this brings is, where are we with the second, with the two-state solution or the one-state solution? I'm, I'm not sure if we have enough time to talk about that. I see it's it's been uh, 57 minutes. We have as much time as you, as, as you have, but I, we don't want to, we don't want to, uh... You want to respect your time as well. Yeah, I mean, and like I know, like Leila and I uh, and you talked about this this like other issue of, of like where we stand on the two state solution versus one state solution. You know, so maybe, maybe yeah, we can yeah. touch on that as the last question before I. Uh, yeah, I was hoping we might get to to talk about that. I mean, there's one way of looking at this where it's like, isn't this just underscoring the demise of what a lot of people have already recognized for a long time anyway? Oslo's been dead for a long time. Right. Um, even the establishment in the Palestinian Authority is, is recognized that formally. And might this not just be hastening now the inevitable one state solution that, sure. I mean, I've believed in for a long time, about as long as I've been following this issue, and I've been laughed at for most of that time. But now it really seems like it's politically maybe the only viable one, now that one, that the two state solution just seems geographically, politically, and in every other conceivable way, just untenable, un unimaginable. What do you think? Is this a hidden blessing of, of pushing too hard? Yeah. It would have been a hidden blessing if we actually have two buttons out there. One of them said two-state solution and one said one-state solution. One-state solution meant uh, like a utopian future where everyone is equal. Unfortunately, that's not the reality because there are different kinds of one-state solutions. Netanyahu would like a one-state solution, but it's a one-state solution of racism and apartheid. That is a one-state solution. So there are different kinds of one-state solutions. I think like when we hear the, the term one-state solution for those who are working on Israel-Palestine, we imagine a radical proposal that came around in the last decade 
where people talked about uh, Israelis and Palestinians, uh, people of Jewish, Christian, uh, Muslim, secular, uh, other backgrounds who live in that historic piece of land called Palestine, that they will all live together peacefully uh, and have equal access to rights and resources. Like that's one vision for a one-state solution. Um, but Netanyahu has a one-state solution too. You know, Netanyahu, Friedman, Kushner, Trump, they also think about one state solution. And that one state solution is a one state called Israel that uh, has uh, two classes of citizens. Uh, one superior class of citizens, one uh, one class of second, one other part of, of, of humans who are second class citizens, uh, literally who will have a separate infrastructure, separate streets, separate uh, documents. They're treated differently. They have less access to resources. So, that, I mean, that is the, the that is apartheid, and that is what we're seeing now in Israel. Israel is becoming a one-state apartheid. Uh, you know, South Africa was a one state. It wasn't two states. It was a one apartheid state where white people had different access to resources and rights than black people. And Israel now is becoming a one state, an apartheid one state, where uh, mostly white people, white Jewish people, have access to uh, rights and resources that no one else has. Um, so it's it's a it's it, like I wouldn't say it's like good news that annexation is happening. Uh, you know the the two state solution has been dead for a long time, as Eric said, and the future is you know w w the struggle is still uh, to determine what kind of a, of a one state will happen in the future. I don't think we're going to have two states. We're going to have one state, but the question at this stage is what kind of a one state are we going to have? Are we, are we going to have a South Africa style one state uh, where, um, you know, um, Palestinians and uh, brown Mizrahi Jews are treated as uh, second class humans? Uh, or are we going to have uh, a, a one state where uh, white Jewish Israelis and uh, Jews of color and Palestinians who are Christian and Muslim and others are all treated equally. That, that, is, the, that is the big question. Yeah, I mean, there is a scenario also where, and I think that part of what you're describing could play into the scenario where it's just the ethnic cleansing becomes complete, you know, where you make the circumstances, which I think is very much a part of the plan and has been the standing plan for decades, just so miserable that people just leave. And that that could either be what you're describing where people, stay and live under an intolerable situation or the ideas make it so intolerable that it just ends up becoming a Jewish majority state and all the Palestinians go out. That's right. I mean, that, was, that was the plan, like their plan since 1948. Uh, not all Palestinians left and I don't think there is a way to get rid of all Palestinians. The majority of humans inside his, historic Palestine um, happen to be Palestinian. And uh, I actually don't know what is a mechanism to get rid of, of Palestinians. 20% uh, of the citizens of the state of Israel are Palestinian. These are um, uh, literal citizens of the state of, of, uh, of Israel who live within the 48 uh, borders who are Palestinian. They identify as Palestinian citizens of Israel. Um, the Israeli state calls them Arabs because they try to deny their Palestinianness, but they identify as Palestinian citizens of Israel. Uh, and then you have, you know, millions of, of Palestinians who live in Gaza um, who are not going anywhere, and millions of Palestinians who live in uh, Jerusalem and uh, Jenin, and they're not going anywhere. Like maybe some some people will leave, will leave because Israel is making their lives uh, impossible and miserable. But not everyone will leave. So we will end up uh, in a situation like which and now. Like when I went to visit um, Israel and Palestine before I was denied entry by the Israeli authorities uh, because of my political work in the US. When I, when I went there, um, I went as a US citizen and I was able to drive on the privileged streets of Israelis. So like you drive on these nice streets, highways, goes in the West Bank, etc. And you can see Palestinian cars driving under us in, in like tunnels on road, road uh, roads that are uh, 
uh, unpaved and uh, l l lesser class uh, in infrastructure. Um, so like the upper tight infrastructure is in your face, you know, like it, it was really shocking to me, although I've heard about it for a long time. And now this is becoming more institutionalized um, to, to create infrastructures that are for uh, Jewish Israelis only uh, who, will, who are driving to their settlements uh, inside the West Bank and infrastructure for Palestinians only. So this apartheid regime is unsustainable. Uh, and the reason why it has been able to stand this long is that our tax dollars have been subsidizing it. But at one stage in the future, like the South Africa apartheid, this apartheid will, will also collapse. There is no, there are no precedents in, in our times for a system that is as racist and white supremacist and um, exclusionary as Israel to sustain forever. There, there are no other precedents. I mean, it never happened before. I don't think it's not going to happen with Israel either. I don't think Israel is going to be an exception to humanity where it will continue to be an apartheid racist state. We will have to come to a, a point where uh, the, um, the infrastructure that is built to maintain this racism and apartheid will collapse and we will have a, a new reality where people will live um, with each other in a peaceful and equal way, uh, different than what the current vision is. And hopefully as soon um, as possible. And, yeah. and, and, and here and there yeah, and everywhere yeah. around the world. <laughs> so I'm noticing, you know, we are uh, we are a little over time, but we've had dozens of people watching um, the broadcast. I want to thank uh, them. I want to give a couple of shout outs. I see Rania, Isam, Laura, Regan, Hindi, the various people that are watching and making comments. Mm -hmm. I want to remind people if you have any final um, questions or comments that you should um, direct them in the comment section and, and we'll look at them. And if they're not addressed now live, we'll address them in other sessions because I'm sure this will be the first of many sessions on this topic. And hopefully we'll be able to bring that back for other future sessions um, because his perspective is so, um, so, so helpful. But Raad, I wanted to know, um, you know, what are you asking the Americans who are watching and people around the world? Because, you know, Eric's in Europe and he's a very global audience. What are you asking them to do to support your advocacy and the people in Palestine who will be impacted by the annexation? I mean, I think like the number one thing to do this week is to contact, if you're a US American, contact Congress. Uh, and when you contact Congress, uh, you can just pick up the phone and call your member of Congress and say, I want you to say no to annexation. If, uh, if you're talking to your senator, I think you should tell them to vote against annexation and support the um, NDAA amendment that I mentioned earlier uh, that uh, defunds annexation. And that's what we've been saying for uh, a long time now. And, you know, like with the help of Leila and others, uh, many organizations have been have been working on um, our, our main motto is uh, defund, refund. So defund uh, human rights abuses by Israel, because this is going from our tax dollars. We have to defund annexation, defund um, imprisoning children, defund killing civilians with our weapons, defund them, take the money back, condition it. And at the same time, refund um, uh, humanitarian assistance to Palestinians and, and basic needs. Like, you know, Le Leila works with UNRWA USA. The Trump administration cut all funding to UNRWA uh, yeah. a couple years ago. It's unprecedented. Uh, the U.S. has been the number one contributor since the uh, the creation of UNRWA in 1951 or something. Exactly, 1950 under President Truman. Every president supported it until the Trump administration. Right. So, so refund these programs like UNRWA, refund uh, USAID projects in Gaza, refund humanitarian aid. So that's what we've been saying. And I think if everyone on this call can uh, contact their member of Congress uh, to, to deliver this message, it's a very simple message. Defund hate and racism and violence in Israel and refund humanitarian assistance and basic human needs in Palestine. 
Yeah. And in particular, really I would imagine, I mean, just to make that clear to people, that means ending the $3.8 billion in U.S. unquestioned U.S. military support every year. Yes, I, I mean, that's what we're asking for. It's, it's not going to happen. Like, uh, like the, the main ask should always be ending the $3.8 billion. Uh, that's what we ask for. What we get is conditioning it, right? Like it's, to put conditions on who would receive it. Now it's going there with no checks and balances. We ask for it to be cut. But in reality, what, what Congress can do and what Congress is doing now for the first time in its history this week is that they're saying, we have to condition that. We have to actually put some conditions on U.S. military aid to Israel. So, so that's, that's our call. Cut it, and until it's completely cut, we have to condition it to make sure that it's not contributing to annexation and to uh, executions in the streets, uh, extrajudicial killings, and, and torture of children in Israeli racist prisons, etc. I just want to add one more thing. I know both Raed and I in our respective organizations are coordinating um, advocacy days in September. Um, my organization, of course, focusing on the humanitarian side. It will be a virtual advocacy day. The exact dates are not confirmed, but um, Raed you know, organizes dozens of people on, that are working on a federal level on Palestine all around the country. and. Um, he has his own plans. Rad, is there anything that you want to share around that sort of initiative that people can yeah. look forward to? Yeah, thanks. That's actually a good plug. Um, we are also planning a, a virtual advocacy day. We have more than almost a thousand people uh, signed up so far uh, for the virtual advocacy. How many? A thousand. One wow, thousand. amazing. Yeah. You know, so it's um, the website is uh, palestineadvocacy.com, palestineadvocacy.org. I think both. Um, if you if you visit it, uh, it, it, you can you can sign up for the Palestine Advocacy Day that will take place on uh, September fourteenth. Uh, um, so check it out. Okay. And then I'll just say a couple of closing thoughts uh, about the show, and then if you want to take us out, Leila, after that, I guess. Um, so everyone, thank you for for joining us. I want to thank our guests again, Raed and uh, my co-host Leila for. Uh, for co-hosting with me. And uh, if you want to catch the earlier episode where I interviewed, I think back in November, that's episode 53 of Latitude Adjustment Podcast. You can get that streaming on the website at latitudeadjustmentpod.com, or you can find it on iTunes and most of the podcast catchers that you get on uh, apps for Android. So that's my plug for the show. And uh, yeah, thank you again, Rod, for for making time at a particularly busy time to talk about two very difficult to tackle, but very important subjects. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me and uh, keep up the great work. Yes, I, I echo your thanks. I echo Eric for making this space and initiating um, this podcast, which I really encourage people to subscribe to. It's helped me learn so much about a variety of topics um, and really this efforts to go live or to help expand my own personal knowledge about um, other issues that I'm not as you know active on, whether it's for my work or otherwise. And I encourage everyone to continue being curious, expanding their minds. Um, thank you again for tuning in. We're gonna keep doing this probably every Friday. Ride, stick around. We're gonna end the broadcast, but just stick around for another minute so we can uh, talk to you offline. Thank you to everyone. Please share if you have not yet shared this uh, video so that it can get greater reach. And we'll see you next time. Thanks everybody.